We've now seen that depending on the process, the work and heat transferred for a process can change. We will now define what is a path function. For a path function, the path from an initial state to the final state defines their magnitude. Therefore, it is necessary to account for each part of the path to the final state. Using our mountain climbing example again, a person may choose one of three paths up the mountain. Regardless of what path the person takes, the starting place and the final place on top of the mountain will remain constant, so the altitude, a state function, remains the same. However, each path will require the, walk or the hiker to walk different distances. In this case, the distance traveled is a path function. The person may decide to go straight up the mountain or decide to take a less direct route, requiring them to walk further. There are many different ways to get to the final state, but the final state will remain the same. Let's relate the lecture material to this concept. We saw that if an isothermal expansion of a gas is done reversibly, this will give a different amount of work than if it is done irreversibly. Both cases, however, means that the system will still arrive at the same final state. We'll also see that the heat capacity at constant volume and at constant pressure are different. So depending on the process, the heat transferred can be different for the same change in temperature. Based on this, we can conclude that the work and heat are path functions. Let's now see how path and state functions interact with each other. The first law of thermodynamics combines the change in internal energy, a state function, with the path function's heat and work. If the process occurs at a constant volume, then there can be no expansion work. That means that the change in internal energy is solely based on the heat transferred. As a result, we can directly calculate the heat capacity at constant volume by measuring the change in internal energy with respect to a change in temperature. A bomb calorimeter with its fixed volume reaction chamber is a device that can be used to make this type of measurement. Let's now look at what happens for isothermal processes. Because the internal energy is determined by the temperature of the gas, if there is no change in temperature, then there is no change in the internal energy. For example, let's look at the expansion of one mole of a monatomic ideal gas. Monatomic gases only have translational degrees of freedom, where each axis contributes one half RT to the total energy, meaning that the total energy is three halves RT. Note that it isn't dependent upon the volume or the pressure, so taking the derivative of three halves RT with respect to volume, because the gas is expanding, and we're holding this at constant temperature, then this derivative is equal to zero. The same could be said if we're taking the derivative with respect to pressure. Now using this, we can relate heat to the change in volume as the gas expands isothermally. Since the change in internal energy is equal to heat plus work, and it's also equal to zero, then we can rearrange this to just write the heat is equal to the negative work. Therefore, if the isothermal process is reversible, then the heat is equal to positive nRT times the natural logarithm of the final volume over the initial volume. What this result tells us is that as the gas expands and does work, heat must go into the system to offset the energy the system is outputting so that the system remains at the same temperature. Let's now look at a couple of examples which illustrate some points covered in this lecture. In this first problem, we're going to examine an idea where nutritionalists are interested in the use of energy by the human body. And so calorimeters have been constructed for people and can measure their energy output. So let's say that a person does 622 kilojoules of work on an exercise bike, and at the same time they lose 82 kilojoules of energy as heat. And so what we're trying to calculate is what is the change in internal energy for the person. And so we would start with our general change of internal energy, which is equal to work plus heat. And what we're going to write in terms of this, since we were actually given explicitly the work and the heat, we can write those in right away, 622. And to that, we're going to add minus 82. So note that there are the two minus signs that I have here. And so in this case, with our sign conventions, when the system does work to the surroundings, then what that means is that the value of the work is negative. And when the system loses heat to the surroundings, that value is also negative. And so basically what we're saying is that as energy leaves the system, either through work or heat, then that ends up being a negative number. 
And as the system gains energy, either through work or heat, that's a positive number. But what that means in the end is that our change in internal energy in this case is minus 704 kilojoules. In this case, our second problem is a little bit more challenging than the first one, but again, it will show a couple of interesting points that we've discussed in the lecture. What we're doing is we're looking at the heating of one mole of a monatomic ideal gas. It's going to be done at constant volume between 293 and 300 Kelvin. And the question is asking to find the work, the heat, and the change in internal energy for this process. And so the order that you find these values can sometimes be different. You, there's more than one way, typically, to find the solution to these problems. And so the order that I'm going to do this in is that I'm going to get the easy ones out of the way first. And when I say easy, you'll see why in a second. But here I'm just writing down for work, which is the first quantity that I'm going to be calculating, is the generic integral that we use to calculate work for every case. But of course, we know that this process is happening at constant volume. And so what that means is that this integral goes to zero since there's no change in volume. There can't be any expansion type work that's done. So that means my work is equal to zero. Let's look at the heat transferred next. So the heat that's transferred is the integral between the initial temperature and the final temperature of the heat capacity specific to this system times little tiny changes in temperature. And so in the problem, we're not actually given what this value with this heat capacity for our one mole of monatomic ideal gas is. But we can certainly calculate it. And we can calculate it by first looking at the internal energy for one mole of a monatomic ideal gas. And we know that that's equal to 3 halves RT. And the thing again I'm going to stress here is that this is per mole of gas. So if we had 2 moles, then we would multiply this number by 2. And so if we want to find the heat capacity, as we've seen just in the previous couple of slides, what we would do is we would then take the partial derivative of this with respect to temperature. We know that this process is happening at constant volume, so we'll specify that. But when we take the derivative of 3 halves RT with respect to temperature, well, the 3 halves are, those are just two constants, and then the derivative of T with respect to T is 1. So this value is just 3 halves times R. And what this gives us then is the heat capacity or the volume heat capacity um, per mole. And so then if we want to turn this into the heat capacity C that we have in that, that integral for our heat, then we just need to multiply this value by the number of moles of the system. And what we can see, or what we know from the problem, is that it's one mole. And we're going to multiply that by 3 halves times r. So when I start to sub in numbers, I'm going to get 3 halves times 8.3145. And that means then my heat capacity is then equal to 12.47 joules per Kelvin. Now I'm just going to take a second and just explain why I chose this value for the gas constant. And the reason why I chose it was that this value, again, has units of decimeters cubed times kilopascals divided by mole divided by Kelvin. And we know that this decimeters cubed, that's equal to joules. And we also know that what we did when we multiplied this 1 in with the r, well, that would cancel out the moles, because this 1 is the number of moles of the system. And again, what this is doing is that it's taking this out from being a molar heat capacity to the heat capacity specific to the system. So it's not per mole anymore. It's actually the value of the heat capacity for our monatomic ideal gas, which is what gives us this 1247 joules per Kelvin, because we'd have joules on top and Kelvin on the bottom. And so this is the number, then, that goes straight into our integral that we're going to calculate now. So let's do that integral. Q is equal to, I can actually write in, or I will write in the specific temperature range, 293 to 300. The C is 1247 dt. When we evaluate this integral, the 1247 is a constant, so we're just taking the integral of dt. So that means we get 1247 times t evaluated from 293 to 300. Fundamental theorem of calculus tells me that I'm going to subtract those two numbers, 300 minus 293. And what that leaves me with is a heat transferred of 87.3 joules. So the little that's left for us to find now is then just the change in internal energy. And that's equal to the work plus the heat. 
And what we saw from our two different or two previous calculations was that our work is equal to zero. And our heat, well, that's equal to 87.3. That means then our change in internal energy is equal to 87.3 joules. We covered a lot of ground in this lecture, and here are a couple of points I wanted to reiterate. The internal energy of a substance is quantified by the equal distribution of energy over the occupied degrees of freedom. The first law of thermodynamics states that the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. The internal energy is a state function, meaning that changes in internal energy are independent of the path taken. Heat and work, which are path dependence and are called path functions, can be used to determine the change in internal energy. They represent the transfers of energy between the system and the surroundings. In order to maximize work of an expansion or a compression process, it must be done reversibly. For isothermal processes, meaning at constant temperature, the change in internal energy is equal to zero. And finally, for constant volume processes, the heat capacity at constant volume is just the change in internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume.